Brilliant. Um, well, I, I think we'll start now. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for another one of our In Conversation talks. Um, we really enjoyed sort of hosting these and, and having sort of everyone sort of with the different speakers. Um, and we can continue to host continue to host them for sort of the rest of the year. Um, we're really lucky today. We're, we're joined today by um, by one of our alums from, from the class of 99, Sarah Turnbull. Um, she's a child environmentalist. She's a social entrepreneur. She's a she's an author. Um, I think my colleague Magda's actually got a book to hand if, if, if anyone's sort of looking at the screens. Um, so yeah, just, I guess, a, a few sort of housekeeping things um, so the, the format of the, the talk today will sort of be about a 20 minute talk from, from Sarah, followed by a Q&A section. Um, please do sort of pop any questions or comments in the chat box. Um, we'll be able to sort of get back to them um, at after the talk in the Q&A section. Um, we'll, I guess, depending on the questions, we'll, we'll sort of unmute you, allow you to sort of directly ask a question to Sarah. Um, and yeah um so just please pop them in the chat um and yeah doing the talk if you can keep yourself on mute that'd be brilliant um and just sort of funnel everything through the chat um and and with that i'm going to hand over to sarah now um we hope you enjoy the talk i mean these have been brilliant um and i'll i'll just hand over to sarah now thanks oh no pressure then keith if they've been brilliant so far what can i do wrong yeah. I'm um, sure it continued, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so everybody, I'm, I'm actually really nervous. I'm, funnily enough, if I was seeing you for real, I wouldn't be nervous. I'm more nervous about the tech than anything else. Um, but yeah, here, let's have a go. So hopefully you can now still see me and you can see the slides as well. And I can, I've actually got a chance to see most of you still as well. Um, okay, so hi, I'm Sarah Turnbull and um, I'm going to give you a talk today about how to be better off working wild. And um, so um, basically all I'm going to say is who I am, why I think work is broken, how I think that we can all fix the system of work by working wild, and also give some tips on how I think we can all be better off by shifting the way that we work. So first of all, who am I? Uh, I'm this naked girl in this picture here having a swim in Wales. That's been pretty much what I've been doing since my Atlantic college days. Um, I, Keith's already done a fantastic introduction to me, so um, I wanted to say that I co-wrote this book with another woman, Jeanette Pritchard, uh, now Jeanette Pierce. Um, she's 10 years older than me, she's also a social entrepreneur. It was one of the most fantastic creative processes writing this with her. She's sick today, so unfortunately she's not able to come, she hasn't got an affiliation with the college, but by God did I pour a lot of what I learned at Atlantic College into the book into the work that I do. Um, and so I'm really pleased to have sort of closed that circle by sharing bits of the book with you and bits of my work in the book with you. And then, um, you know, hope that we all can make this add up into uniting for a, a bit of a better world. Because I do think work is really quite broken. Um, so I'm new at being an author, but I believe that every so often you've got to say, I wrote a book. Um, so I wrote a book, <laughs> this is it. It's called Better Off Working Wild. And it's about how changing the way we work will make us all better off. And by better off, I really don't mean rich, as in wealth in terms of money. I mean better off in the truest sense of the world. So well connected to friends, true to our own sense of self and really thriving in the ways that make us truly happy. Um, so I've said that work is broken um, and I think the reasons that I think that work is broken is that I just see people feeling massively exploited, undervalued, overworked. And this isn't in that lower income bracket alone. This is in all income brackets. I see people working too many hours, feeling fractured in themselves, and feeling very disconnected from their actual lives. Um, even those people like myself who've been incredibly driven and absolutely love the work that they're doing, although the content of the work might have been brilliant and the impact of the work might have been brilliant, the physical cost of work sometimes can be awful. So I don't know your stories, but my story is that I spent a lot of time sleeping underneath my desk, underneath a high vis, working 36 hour shifts. I've done that in theater, I've done that in architecture. And I took this kind of broken way of working 
for other people in companies and even managed to do it to myself, even when I set up my own company to try and change the way I work to be a better place. And I came to the conclusion that you know, through my through all the work that I've done, I've been a cleaner, I've earned enough to have my own cleaner, through all of that work in different places in society, that it isn't me that's the problem, it's the whole system of work. And so I just wanted to sort of take you through the maths. I love an Excel spreadsheet. Um, maybe you're even just going to turn your minds off, so I will speak to you in words about this maths. So I understand there's a column here for the total hours that men work on average in a week and that women work on average. I understand that there are many more genders than that, but I've just taken the text, the, the figures I had access to were men, women. And then I've just taken an average across men and women because I, I'm not here today to make a gender point, but I think the numbers make their own gender point. Um, but this is my pitch. I don't think full-time work adds up. I think the sort of heteronormative male female couple when women came out of the home to work it would have been economically rational indeed socially rational for men to stay in the house you know for people in those mixed sex couples to just split the work between them because there's work that needs doing inside the house and there's work that needs doing outside the house and so my general argument is that everybody is now doing roughly two maybe three jobs and you can see I've gone through and gathered data here you can see that actually people are doing if you say an average work week employed for, for money is 35 hours a week you can see men on average are doing almost three times that women on average are doing quite a significant chunk more and we don't have time to get to really sensible things that we need to do as humans like sleep make love hang out with friends and I think it's all been if anything, exacerbated by COVID and by the changing way of work. But this whole, whole moment in time does give us a real reckoning and a real moment to make a seismic shift. So I don't know what you think of when you think of work. Um, I'm sure that you have like really good associations with work and I'm sure that you've also been burnt by purpose or you've put too much of yourself into some work, some jobs, but I'm told on good authority um, nobody dies wishing that they just worked a bit more um, and I've done some diagnosis with my um, colleague and friend G JP uh, that's what we call Jeanette Pritchard we call it JP um, so I'm not it's not some kind of a society or secret club I'm a member of it's my friend JP so JP and I have done some work and we've we've diagnosed what we consider to be common work disorders so when we did this piece of work, we imagined that most people would feel one, maybe two or three of these. These were all things we'd felt. We shared these with friends, family. I actually shared them with the, uh, we've got a WhatsApp group for the, the class of 99. So I shared it with them. And what I found was that people on the whole were suffering with about 80 to 90% of this. So I thought we could just, I'll stop talking for a second. I'll work out how on earth I get to see the chat. And I wondered if you could have a little self-diagnosis. So give yourself a minute or two to have a look at these and see if there's one or two that sing out to you in that really awful gut sense. Oh dear, that's me. I am taking it out at home. I'm too stressed. I've become a bitch when I get home. Or I am time starved. I never have enough hours. And then just see if you can self-declare your self-diagnosis. And I will fiddle with the technology. How on earth does anybody want to tell me how to see the chat? while I'm presenting. Uh, you may have to come out of the, the sharing screen to see. Oh, so then I'm I may not... have to use you, Keith, as my other person yeah. who yeah, can I, give I this can let you know the highlights. Is that possible? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if, yeah, if anyone's sort of having a look through, please do pop in sort of your thoughts into the chat and then I'll, I'll share them with Sarah. And don't hold back. If you need to admit that you suffer from more than two or three of these, please do. Uh, so Tams and Jordan has uh, come in with financially insecure, addicted to work and bored by work. Um, Kay, who's a, a parent of an, of an alarm, constantly on, financially insecure, managed by Egypt's, trapped by responsibility. So yeah, I think most people have definitely got a handful. Yeah, 
Yeah, OK, well, I don't want to think it's always bad form to stay in the, the land of uh, what the problem is for too long. And I think when, as we were writing the book and sort of preparing the support program that goes around it, we were really keen that this wasn't one of those books that you read and then you think on page 90, 100 out of 99, it then says, oh, you could change a light bulb or maybe you should try just sleeping eight hours a night. You know, we really wanted to make the vast majority of the book about the solutions. Um, so I just kind of wanted to come back now to thinking about what I mean when I talk about wild before I explain what I mean when I talk about working wild. So you'll notice that I've chosen a picture of uh, one of my friends having a rather good time at Glastonbury here. So when I say wild or when JP and I say wild, we mean not just wide open natural spaces and the natural world. We mean that wild within you as well as the wild without. So when when we're talking about it essentially it boils down to being your truest self to being being able to feel free to move as you want to feel connected to the core of yourself and your being as well as that, that core within everybody else that you're relating to as well as your place in and as part of nature so that said like that's kind of where we're at with work and wild so what the fuck is working wild and um, so working wild is our concept of a, a better way of working that allows you to be more connected and that is focused on success in the truest sense we really wanted to start to reclaim success not as climbing a ladder or making millions or turning over huge volumes of um i don't know projects or awards or accolades but success in terms of I've got a roof over the head, my head, I have time to spend with friends and family, and then whatever success beyond that means to you. Um, and so the next bit now really is to sort of think about, well, how do you get the attitude? You know, so with anything, we're trying to change a whole structure and a whole system of working. It's not just something we can do in 10 minutes while we go off and sit in a corner. So the first thing you need to have a look at is your attitudes. And so what we've done is we've boiled down a system of um, broken work attitudes. So it's kind of five core attitudes that you'll tend that the dominant system of work has a, a tendency to bring you towards. So selling your soul, putting things off until you retire. My favourite one, of course, is powercock, which is the parading of your ego. And that kind of like, let's get it done. Let's do it my way. And these are methods and modes of working that are not necessarily your fixed personality, but they may be ways of working that you tend towards when you get very stressed or that managers tend towards when they're under pressure. Um, and they affect the whole feeling of being at work, but also the whole, the whole philosophy behind who we are and why we're working. I, I admit that you've got to have boring days at work. I don't think, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about everybody being freelancers or everybody not having to work any more than two or three hours you know I just I think that it whether we're working behind the bar at a Burger King or we're you know we're working um, in a finance office or in insurance I think there are attitudes that we can have that will make us succeed so against those broken work attitudes we set out what we think is the sort of the opposite of that the working wild attitude um, so if the broken work attitude is I am consumer, which is this constant reduction of everything that we are and everything we do to being purchasers of somebody else's labour, someone else's product, rather than craftspeople and connected to ourselves and to nature and seeing, seeing the world as one united thing. Um, and I, you can read, so I'm not going to do that awful thing speakers do where they kind of read one bit and then they read another bit, but I think it's really important to look at where your joy comes from in life, whether you've got time for me to be to do craft. And um, that might be something that you don't even need to make money for, that you just make time for. Um, and so your working wild attitude might be, yeah, you do sell your soul a little bit, but you know that you're only going to do that four days a week. And then in your fifth day, you're going to pursue your, I don't know, wood carving, not necessarily as a career, but just because it brings you joy. And. Um, and so kind of looking at this um, sort of the key bits here then, enough is enough. Um, this is really about knowing what sufficiency is. Now that might be sufficiency in terms of income. I, mean, I think an interesting question to ask yourself if you're looking at making a shift in the way you work is, at what level of income would I choose to not work 
anymore or to work less because I think you sort of start your early stage of work if you haven't come from a wealthy background then your early years in work are about being able to stand on your own two feet and I think we quite often slip way past that in terms of our incomes you see people earning hundreds of thousands of pounds and still feeling like they're not surviving still feeling like they're not quite well paid enough still feeling like they're somehow being cheated or they need to be able to afford a better nanny or you know and it's just that genuinely knowing what is sufficient brings you space and time for more of what you love um, and then finally I think own your breath and gentle warrior are two really important things and uh, they're particularly key to me because I think coming into this process this is a lot of what JP brought so I am very power cocky I do get really angry and aggro but JP my partner is a real gentle warrior so she leads with love she's always looking for ways to be kind and she's always looking for ways to drop her ego and I think that that's a very helpful one and she's also um intensely focused on owning her breath and being in that moment every moment not leaving things to retirement and that's not necessarily just for example leaving your own joy so um, we've all heard stories of people who were planning to go to Mexico when they retired and they dropped dead six, six months afterwards and never got there. It's not just those things, but it can be about some people think that it's a good way to work to go into, I don't know, a sector that they're not particularly interested in, for example, finance, make a shitload of money. And then when they're in their 60s, try and give that money away. And when they retire, do good for society and leave a legacy. You know, and we genuinely think like legacy is something you can do as you go. You can really own your breath. You can be the constant in your life and you can make great choices all the way through rather than storing things up till the end. So that's a little bit about the attitudes. And I just got to be quiet for a couple of, well, as long as I'm capable of being quiet for when I'm actually being, being here to be a speaker, but just to give you a moment to absorb it and to go through in your own sort of mind and think, where are you today on these scales? Where are you when you get stressed and your, your worst self and where would you like to be? Just think about the shifts you might like to make. And there's um, way too many of us for us to do a workshop exercise, but obviously it would be lovely to be able to compare these things with each other. Um, and maybe that's something that we can come back to when we've got time for questions at the end. I don't want to um, stress the form out, format out too much by waiting here too long, but I do think there's a really interesting set of conversations here. Is it everything that we do starts from starts and finishes with our attitude, you know, to what we get up to do every day. Um, but I think really more than anything, if you're going to make a big change in your life, you're going to change the way that you work or that your team or your organisation works. One of the big things that you need to be doing is choosing tools. Um, and so what JP and I did when we wrote the, the book um, was we took the work that we've done. I think we have mentored now over 1500 small businesses and entrepreneurs um, and then a significant number of like large name brand organisations. Um, and we took everything that we've been doing as social entrepreneurs and as business coaches through our work life. And also the experimentations we've done on our own team. I think between us, we've run eight different businesses. Um, and we try to refine like what are the tools that really make things better for work, that really make not just organisationally huge shifts in terms of people, people produce more or things become, you know, more successful in the kind of commercial terms, but actually what is it that gives people the space to succeed and the space to really grow as individuals and therefore want to continue to engage with you so you can retain great people um, and so we made it started as a bit of a joke um, but actually it turned out to be really I think quite a useful document so we made an A to Z of working wild so we made 26 tools each letter is a tool um, and it, within the tool we kind of set out what's the philosophy what's the evidence base from our research we did very wide research um, drawing the best of other people's thinking and then also what's the evidence based from our, our own stories the case studies of people we've worked directly with um, and then we looked at boiling that tool down to 
three things you can do if you're an individual, three things you can do as a team leader, three things you can do as an organization. So that's the great thing about the book is you can stick it on your desk and you can kind of leaf through it and grab the bits that you need at the time. So I kind of can't go through 26 tools. It seems a little bit ludicrous. I want to get to the bit where we talk to each other, but I, what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of a sense of some of this. So I've made up the word unite because I think we're United World Colleges. And I thought that was some, you know, sort of, it's a word that resonates with us. Um, and then I'm giving you these letters. So this is my little gift to you. So you can read, I'm not gonna read them out, but I will take you through these five tools. Um, and obviously I had to put naughty and naked in because that's one of my favorite tools. So you is for undaunted. So this is about being brave and giving yourself permission to be brave. And that's not necessarily about not feeling fear. And so we had a look quite a lot of this section looks at um, the tradition of warriorship, which is shared and common across many cultures in the world. And at the center of all of those ideas um, is that being a warrior is not about being someone who's not frightened. Being fri not frightened is dangerous. Being undaunted in a warrior is about feeling the fear and knowing how to take command of yourself and get through difficult things and take on those hard and complex tasks that actually everybody benefits from when you do um, and so we've kind of we've gone through and we've given sort of specific things that you can do to help yourself be more undaunted um, but I just wanted to give you this sort of little bit of poem about when you know you need to do it so you will know that you need to be undaunted when you're starting to feel out of place and when you're starting to feel some anger or when you're starting to feel that things just aren't right you know it's that little bit of part intuition and part values and that kind of united world college ethos will tell you when you need to be undaunted it's when you've got to have the fight the good fight um and so yeah we just wanted to say like this can also be like in the how you change the way that you work context. This can be about being brave to say, I'm not gonna climb the ladders. I'm happy to get to middle management and then tune out a little bit. I'm not going to keep pushing. I'm going to tune out a little bit, box work off and spend some time outside of work. You know, don't climb ladders, grow trees. That's where we got to with that. N is for naughty and naked. Um, so this section looks at how important being naked is. Um, for our own physical health we set out lots and lots of stats and then for people who are worried about their bodies um, or about nudity um, because I'm obviously I spent after Atlantic College I went to um, live in Japan for many years and was lucky enough to spend every day bathing there I had to, no hot water in my house it's a bit of a theme in my life that I often live somewhere with no running water or no hot water um, but I really valued, the, they call it in Japan, naked friendships. And so going to the, um, going every day to the bath, to, to be with the, all of the local residents and to see, see each other naked was a real, like fundamental part of my growth as a, as a young adult to know that, um, Although I, as an outsider to Japan, tended to think that Japanese people would be shy of their bodies. Actually, in single sex context, they aren't. And I had fantastic time making huge and diverse friendships. Uh, but this could be as simple as going barefoot. This doesn't need to be, let's all get naked and go down to Ogmore and shake our bits. So, um, and I think the, the the nudity there is less important than the honesty. So um, there's a you know, there's a sense, I think, um, you know, in Sauna Veritas is one of the things that you, it's a common inscription you might see so that the truth comes out when you're naked. It's about not hiding things as well as, you, you know, whipping your tits out. So I think that kind of being really true and really honest and not feeling like you have to hide. And the naughty bit is about that fact that nobody really gets celebrated for being a goody two shoes you know and it's really important to remember that that rebel spirit is as important and fundamental to the change making process as just getting on and being a good person and um, you know i think you know it's just sort of the bit to leave you with is we're born to be wild and um, but we 
Yeah. And then I, I think this is something I don't need to teach you guys. You know, you've all, you've, you've done Atlantic College or you've done one of the other UWCs, you know what service is. So what we were doing here is decanting that service programme that we've all been through and that we've all seen has fundamentally shifted our way of living and the, our concept of what the purpose of life is for. And therefore, the breadth of what we understand to be better off, because I can't be better off if other people are not being helped when I could help them. So we looked at um, how you can be of service and how that can connect back to who you are in the work that you do. Um, and also as an organization to really look at the purpose of organizations. So going beyond that concept of just purpose as a thing that's a CSR target, but really looking fundamentally, is this organization radically dealing with climate change? Is this organization dealing with the wealth gap or is this organization part of the problem? So we kind of give um, business leaders tools to look at and assess how they might be able to shift, shift things. Um, T is for thrive. So this is really important to me um, because it's that sort of the S of the A to Z is survive. So I'm really, really keen um, having gone to Atlantic College on a full scholarship and this, this ability to, like working is something that I did secretly when I was at AC. Um, you know, I was working for money. I, my house parents even asked me like, why don't you have any money in house bank? I was like, what money do you expect me to put in house bank? No one's giving me any money to put in house bank. So the S of, is about survive. And so fundamentally it's very hard to have this flexibility and this freedom if you aren't making your ends meet, you know, and this is one of the things is the phrase is survival capitalism. It's okay to accumulate wealth when you need to get a roof over your head, when you need food to eat that, that, so we, we give people tips on how to budget. We give real structure on how to know and understand and manage your life costs so that you can get into the thrive state. Um, and I think that's really critical because I didn't want this to be a book just for people who are from a certain income bracket or from a certain level of comfort. Um, and I think that said, I do know um, so many people who, although they may be surviving financially, are not thriving, you know, so although they have money rolling in and rolling out, they are not singing in their heart. So T for five is looking at people to really understand what their joy is and pursue the, the good life. And then I wanted to end on E, not just because the word unite handily ends on E, um, but because E is a reminder, it's easy now, you know, I think uh, anyone who's lived in Wales will have heard the phrase, anyone who was around in, in the late 90s, certainly. And taking time off really is part of the process. Rest is really part of how we can be our most creative selves and our most productive selves. And I think at the time we wrote the book, it was before COVID, it was before Zoom. I mean, obviously Zoom existed, but it's before we got the kind of the feeling of Zoom fatigue. And one of the things we talked about was there's a commonality of many people we work with who were running from one meeting to the next, and not having time to have a wee. And that was definitely happening for a lot more people when Zoom first hit the work scene. People were just back to backing with no, none of that time to go get the cup of tea, to go and visit the toilet, uh, to do. Um, I'm always told by JP at this point to not whinge on about what you're in because it's not, that's not the point. The point is, if you don't have time to go to the toilet, what on earth do, else don't you have time for, you know? And that's how low your self is on your priority lists when you're letting work run you ragged to that stage. Um, and, you know, we all know that we've put the bath on this picture. Um, we all know the story, um, you know, of somebody who couldn't crack a problem and then got into the bath and boom, there the answer is. So we really wanted to say that, you know, as a manager, it's really important to understand that people you are in your team, you can't run them ragged all the time. Like you can get them to knuckle down when there's a deadline. That's brilliant. And knuckling down, as we all know from <laughs> what we went through and in, in our two years at the college, knuckling down actually does form friendships. It does force fantastic things out of you that you never knew you were capable of. But doing that all of the time is basically you're just running on adrenaline and you're running yourself dry. So it's just a reminder to take it easy. And I'm literally sat behind you all is my bath. Um, I just received in the post today a blow up bath because I live in a place that only has a shower 
And I was really struggling to manage my life when I couldn't get into hot water. So I've turned this conservatory into uh, my own little bathhouse and I had a little, little moment to be easy before I came in to talk to you. So you may or may not be glad to know that's my, my last letter. So the kind of the, so what, what can you do? I mean, I just want to encourage people to be work activists, to think that the system of work isn't right. This isn't just a personal problem you've got or your sister struggling with. This is something that many people in, this, in the system that we have are struggling with. So let's be at work activists, let's campaign to change work. Let's do what we can as individuals and as team leaders to, to make that happen. And um, obviously, I then have to say read the book because that's what you say. Um, and we we're in the process of putting together a better off club. So, and the first stage of that is on our website, which is just up here, betteroffedits.com. We've got um, a sort of set of blogs. So, if you've got a story that you want to tell around these kind of themes, we're really interested. I'm really interested in talking to you and seeing if you want to feature on our blog, because we want it to be not just us that's talking about this. Like JP and I are activists at heart, and I think we really, we didn't write the book so that we'd earn loads of money writing a book because that would be a really stupid plan. We wrote the book because we felt that there were powerful messages here that needed sharing. And as you all know, like one person or two, even two people dancing around making a noise isn't, isn't big, like it's a movement thing. So if you're interested, I really love to carry on talking to you. I'm sure that I overran, but um, I think we've got plenty of time for questions and lots of happy, seeing lots of really supportive smiles. So I'm feeling good about that. And rattle. I'm trying to work on the endings of my presentations. I feel like I might have failed. So uh, I'm just going to stop. Brilliant. Well, well, thank you, Sarah. It's really sort of really interesting to sort of think about sort of work in, 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 in that sort of way. Um, we've had a few questions come in. Great. Um, Does anyone know how I get the slides to go away? <laughs> uh, I I think you just sort of exit. Uh, oh yeah, it's underneath you. It's because I've drawn this. I know the slides. Are basically, uh -huh. I've drawn it out so I can see you all. There we go. Yeah. Okay, sorted. Brilliant. Um, yeah. So we've had a few questions pop through. Um, we actually had a comment, I think, which from, from Luciana just saying. As a matter of fact, COVID has made it even more difficult to take time off. Um, even though oh, you're, yeah. probably, yes, it's, <laughs> you're, you're, you're sort of flat out the whole time. Um, yeah, it really has. Yeah. Um, and I think there was a real um, sort of fracture in society when COVID happened. There was, so there was a group of people that had to go to the front line and risk their lives in an unknown, pretty much war zone. And they are run ragged. Then you had a group of people who were in the UK context furloughed, so whose work was stopped and they were put into a seemingly endless freeze break, freeze fall, oh, free fall even, it's freezing and being falling, wasn't it? And they've, they've had an unending stress and they've gone back into that survival mode. Um, and, and then you had all this awful media that was going, oh my God, I've run out of things to do. I've made all the banana bread in the world. And like, what else will I do? Shall I learn sourdough? And, and meanwhile, the rest of us were all just going, shit, <laughs> we're doing like our normal jobs and we're managing all this fucking risk. And we're just, and now I don't even get to go hang out with people I like or uh, don't even live in a country where I can buy alcohol anymore. So, you know, it was really, yeah, I think Luciano, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. It really has made it more difficult for many people to take time off. And those yeah. people who had the gift of a lot of time off only have that gift in the context of ongoing lack of security, which is never an easy or joyful place. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, one of the questions that's come in actually is you mentioned you've worked with sort of some some big big name brands and sort of 1500 companies, um, especially with big name brands, what sort of level of resistance have you had to sort of changing their working culture and at what sort of level within the companies has that resistance been most prominent, whether it's sort of senior levels, sort of middle management or sort of junior um, what have you sort of come across from dealing with them? Yeah. So I think the kind of the, the common rebuttal is, oh, it's just motherhood and apple pie. You know, and I'm like, bloody hell, if it wasn't for motherhood, we wouldn't ever be here. And if it wasn't for apple pie, what would you have after tea? You know, like these are the things that make life. And I think, you know, there's, it's easier to overcome the argument around 
commercial context because you can start to break down things like well even if you don't believe in this this is what the millennials and gen, gen z need and so this is the change this is a fundamental change and so for staff retention you need to be investing so i think the kind of the commercial argument is easy to make but when you're speaking to people who are so stuck in the broken work attitude essentially what we're finding is we have to break down for them their internal barriers to freeing up their own way of working and it's that i think i found actually people who are close to retirement often men they find these things really easy because they've hit the point where they realize they gave too much and they want to protect other people from doing that plus they also a sort of there's a weird frailty that comes there's a moment where they sort of just go legacy give back to the youth and at that moment there's a real insertion point where you can really work with those people and i think being male and close to retirement does tend to mean you you in many contexts you can be quite senior so we're having quite a lot of success at that level um but then they're having to bring a board along with them so there will always be other people. So then they're having to do this internal work to then help other people overcome their barriers. Um, was that helpful? Was I meant to name drop brand names? I'm not very good at no, that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. Um, I guess speaking of youth, I mean, we, we've had a question uh, from Peter Howe, who I, I think I'll just unmute to ask it. Thanks, Keith. Lovely to hear your talk, Sarah. And my question is, remembering your time at the college and what you've learned since, how would you redesign or reimagine the student experience? I mean, one of the ongoing jokes wow. within UWC is the th three S's, you know, study, socialize and sleep, and they always sacrifice sleep. And that's a sleep deprivation is a huge issue, yeah. um, particularly with mental health. And, and so, and time is at such a premium for anything we want to do so can you imagine a redesign oh and i've got so many opinions on that um I, i've got a helicopter flying over at the minute so apologies if that's making me hard to hear i mean i've got you, you know the big vision would be sell the castle move to a boring building use the money from selling the castle to um, invest heavily in just actually bringing the alumni network back because you did it, you know, like this is 1962, people are in a pub in London, they think the way to save the world is to train loads of 16 to 18 year olds, because 16 to 18 is the moment you can get them. You, you bloody got us, look at us all, we're sat here. Who's running the world now? Us. What are we doing? Running it in a bad way, like everybody else, trying to change things in like little piecemeal. So fundamentally, I would abandon the students um, and just focus on the alumni. But I, I, I can sense, I can see a lot of amusement that that would be how you achieve the mission because you did the mission, right? Part one was educate, part two is change. Um, but I think in terms of redesigning this student experience, fundamentally, I liked the compressedness. So Atlantic College at the time I went is different from other people's experiences through the years. But at the time I went, we still had that brilliant freedom to take risk. And so I think that fundamentally this, the college is struggling now with being able to allow people to take risks and to, to, to be genuinely undaunted. And then that, that rescue-based service is getting replaced with stuff that's less, less actually dangerous and less actually real. And teenagers, I think, in the work I've done with young people since leaving the college, everybody responds to reality but particularly young people respond to reality so I think I, I think there's something about being able to sensibly reintroduce risk and I think there's a there are issues with that in the health and safety framework but I, I know that Outward Bounds have been doing a lot of work Princess Trust have been doing a lot of work about how we can allow people to take risks with their lives that are measured that give freedom and I do think that the spirit of adventure I had was absolutely accelerated by Atlantic College. And I, I could see that my spirit of adventure could be tied with my drive to change society in service. And that's, that's gone through my whole life with me. And I have little goosebumps as I'm talking about it. So I, I can see people nodding. I know that happened to others. So if we could find a way to do that. That would be great. I liked that 
the time that I went, we had this sort of, basically you did school in the mornings and then you did service and activities in the afternoon. And that was brilliant. But no one sat with me and told me to turn off. And it's taken me until now to learn that and I'm 40. But I think I had really specific sort of therapeutic needs that needed addressing. And I, I understand from talking to current staff that the college is really invested in having counsellors on site. And I think there's some real focus on mental health and safeguarding that really could have been helpful for me when I was a student. So I don't want to be like, oh, it was great in the past and now it's rubbish. Um, sleep is massively important and, and hugely underrated in society. So, yeah. I, I think you can enforce that, but what more can you do with a, a melting pot of teenagers, you know, then make them be in a room by 10 o'clock and try to not feed them until breakfast, you know? I think the rest of it's got to be come from the people. But I do think there's something, um, Kerry, who's online, was doing some really exciting stuff around using entrepreneurship and refocusing and the baccalaureate curriculum around entrepreneurship. And again, it's back to that what's real what real what's real matters and bringing I think we didn't talk about careers at the time I was there I don't know what the conversation's like now I, I'm, I remember there was a dusty corner and I went through and I said oh maybe I'm going to be an architect and my mum said is that just because it begins with a and I think it might be true actually <laughs> I don't know and I, I think I was quite disappointed I did a sort of a google search on uh, or a linkedin search for a United World College alumni and that Obviously, that's alumni who show themselves as alumni who are on LinkedIn, which is a certain subset. But the vast majority of people work in finance and management consulting. So it's not just that we're running the, build, the, the, the world. We're specifically like harnessing the world to feed our own bank accounts. And that, I think, wasn't the purpose. Um, and I probably have a few more campaign like things to say about the difficulty with getting scholarships. So I got a scholarship, I was there, I had my background, that added to the diversity of the college and the college experience. And I think some of the stuff you've got now with students drinking lots and some of those problems are fundamentally about having very uh, an, a, a wider proportion of very wealthy people who have probably had very difficult lives in a neglect type way. And so they've got their own therapeutic issues they're bringing and they're living it out by drinking, which, you know, I'm not saying I didn't drink, I'm not saying I wasn't a problem child, but I think you've got this sort of need to readdress the scholarships. So that's why, that's why the plan of selling the castle makes sense because you can then provide scholarships. Yeah, I think I'll wrap up there because obviously there's a reality to the college and I, I think it's still doing some really fantastic things. Well, well thank you. Um... I guess in, in some of those, I, I definitely recommend sort of anyone listening or, or if you speak to anyone to join the InTouch series of talks because we, we definitely sort of, I guess, explore more of those yeah. uh, ideas. So, so if anyone has any questions or thoughts about those, they're sort of definitely ones to join so you can get a better idea of what's going on at the college now. Um, but one of the other questions we've, we've come in is for you is what's next for you and what's next for the better off working wild initiative i mean have you got any plans in place is there another book in the future um, that you guys are going to put together well when when we were writing the book we realized we had about six books in a, in us um and we got really excited we're like we'll do a book every year and when one point we were going to do a book every quarter it turns out writing a book is really hard <laughs> <laughs> and that even when you've written the book there's this whole peer process called editing and publishing and that actually took a lot of time so I think there might be other books I think um we wanted to tackle other subjects we had all these high hopes I think what we realized is there's a, an awful lot in work so we had plans of what we would do once we launched it but people have kind of come to us so we've started uh, before we could create a training program which we wanted to do we had people naturally coming to us and asking for training so I think we'd like to focus on um, listening more to people's stories I think if we did write another book we'd probably want to try and do something where we take people's stories and tell the stories of other people so that you get a sense that this is a movement and not just us um, I think we're going to focus on doing the training um, but right now um, JP is actually really ill and so I'm kind of going through that awful moment of you know just 
waiting for her to not be really ill and she's going through that moment of taking time for herself and um, I think the big thing that we've been doing is fundamentally applying the book to ourselves because we didn't write this because we're bastions of working perfectly we wrote this because we are people who've danced very closely with workaholism and we you know JP gave birth on the phone like to a client that's you know that's kind of what she was doing while she was in labor because that project was really important and that client really needed her and labor takes a damn long time um and so I think we wanted to fix ourselves and the way we work and so um I'm personally focusing on I've made a little phrase from the A to Z which is made it which is to remind me that I'm not poor anymore and that I should mess around that I should be eat um in airplane mode more often and I can kind of go through the rest of made it but you already know most of the other letters from Unite actually um yeah and I think we've realized that we don't need this to be the biggest, baddest thing ever with, you know, a team of 40 people, because that will just make us feel really dry and won't bring us joy. So what we want to do is talk to really interesting people, give really, fun, you know, fantastic, exciting talks and trainings and and look at how we can work less and have more impact. That's that's how we're applying it. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, and another question we've had sent across is, as I guess from an employee's perspective, I mean, do you have any suggestions of ways that they can bring that working wild attitude to work as I guess, especially if they may work for like multinationals or large organizations of what they can do to bring it into their sort of daily life to. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some really little tools that I think you can start to do. So one of them is the hundred club. So that's where like, you can just propose in the middle of a, a Zoom meeting that's quite long, but you do a hundred club. The hundred club is, I do, I, I invent 10 exercises. So I'll say 10 squats. We all stand up and do 10 squats. And then I call Tamsin. So it's something that you would have done it in some sort of game at Atlantic College. Tamsin, Mike, what's your, what's your exercise, Tamsin? My star jumps. Everyone star does. jumps. Yeah, I'm not going to make you guys do it. I don't know what time zone you're in, but you know, you kind of, and you can do this. And so, but what you're doing there is you're starting to move your body, you're getting the blood circulating, you're challenging the concept that working involves sitting down and staring at the screen, and you're promoting then a bit of a conversation around um, some of the context. Oh my God, yeah, donut economics. We, yeah, I can see Christian's conversation coming in. Yeah, we, we, we quote Kate Walworth in the, um, in the book. And one of my current clients outside of Better Off Edits in Workwild is um, Oxford City Council, where we've been helping them do a donut economy based um, economic strategy. So, yeah, we do. We do see this fundamentally as very, very connected. Um, yeah. Is that you, uh, Christian? Are you in, with the pink wall? That is you. Oh, it's curtain, isn't it? Not a wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, one of the other questions we came, that came through is, did you find the framework of working to the letters of the alphabet in the book restricting or liberating <laughs> some of the other frameworks you may have considered? There were so many. Um, we had like one point a pentagram. We had like a star. We had all these different things. And then as a, as a joke on a train just for myself, I, I thought I'd do an A to Z. And I probably got about a third of the letters right intuitively. And then some, there's so many letters. So the first thing we found was 26 is a lot of tools. And, and we really wanted to make sure that they weren't wank and that they weren't repetitive. And so it, it, to get the first half of it done wasn't too hard. And then we were like, we'd given it to people to read and all of our readers were like, this book's fantastic. But a couple of them said, are you sure you can pull this A to Z off? <laughs> it's a lot of letters. So we were like, oh. And then we're like, well, what else have we got? We're going to focus on it. So we did quite a lot of, uh, even when we were working on the book, we were working in the ways of the book. So we used lots of the letters, the tools that we did have to then find the rest of the tools. And um, yeah, some of them, it was a bit of a running joke in my house anyway, um, where we'd finished the book apart from three letters. And so th the three letters that were last were look in the shadows, um, which is look, encouraging people to not, come to work in their toddler self like I find as a manager and as a worker I've definitely been there as a toddler and I've definitely managed lots of people's toddler self so we were encouraging people to access therapy and therapeutic type support to deal with their toddler self 
And I think that that was hard for us to write because we had to finish that work on ourselves. We had to do the reading around it, which we're not experts in therapy, you know, and we had to be convinced that we weren't just coming up with something light that you'd read in a magazine at an airport, you know, that this was something that was going to be useful to people. And I think, frankly, we were a bit scared about talking about therapy in a work context. But again, I think what's happened with COVID is that mental health is very much more on the agenda because we are more isolated. We're having to be more vulnerable with each other. We're seeing each other's homes. Um, and then another final letter was F, which is friendship. And so that's about this process that happens where somebody starts as a colleague, but you refine it into a real friendship. So it shifts into friendship. And I think that took us a while to write because that has what happened to us. So you, you might be assuming JP and I ran all these businesses together, but actually I was uh, chairing a board for the mayor of London, advising him on um, affordable workspace for small businesses and JP was a board member. So for four years, I chaired meetings that she was in and when I first asked the group to introduce ourselves, she said, I'm JP and I make um, charities more uh, enterprising and businesses more social impact, have more social impact. And I was like, that's my line. And so I kind of had this spiritual connection to her and I could have made a decision to get really jealous or annoyed with her or try and outshine her, but I just liked her. But for four years, we, we maybe spent four, four hours with each other. And then I, she let me hire her for a job and she hadn't worked for anyone else since she was, I think, 23 when she set up her first business. So she was like, this is really weird. I don't believe I've let you hire me. What are we going to do? I said, oh, we're going to solve this problem in the Royal Docks. We did a workshop with some clients. And then right at the end, I said, oh, you know, when we went for dinner and you mentioned you were writing a book. She said, yeah. I said, oh, I'm writing a book too. Can I show you my chapters? So I showed her the chapters and she went, Jesus, this is quite a similar book. And we're both so like front foot forward, jump in with your wellies on type of people. We were like, let's write a book together. And it was only like a week later when we had our first meeting about it, we were like, we don't know each other. And in doing the book, I found out we both worked in theatre. I found out, you know, we found out so much about each other. And I think um, we did have a friend shift like, for ourselves. So that's possibly why it took so long. Um. Her, sorry I, I'm really conscious that I'm just banging on about myself and <laughs> that's I guess that's the format of this situation but um please no, ask I, more it's, questions it's <laughs> that are useful to you <laughs> like yeah no I mean I, I think it's sort of it, it's definitely had a lot of people sort of thinking about work and thinking about sort of that balance yeah. and that well-being especially as you say yeah. sort of having worked remotely for the last yeah. year for a lot of people it's it's, it's yeah. definitely a forefront for a lot of a lot of thought at the moment um there's a question i don't know if i totally answered around what can employees do maybe at a junior level so one thing i did when i was an employee at arab was i asked for a four-day week and it was i mean now that's something that you probably can just do it's a conversation about it but the time i asked which must have been about 12 years ago it was weird and they uh, but Arab was a very, it's an incredible engineering company. It's a bit more like a university than a business, really. And um, so I asked, can I have a four-day week? And the managers thought about it. And they came back to me with a proposition that they would, they would, I would just work four days. And then uh, in my fifth day, I would still be being paid, but I'd do whatever I like. And I thought about that. And they were like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, oh, I want to make jam. I want to research buildings. I was just like cycle around Hackney and look at things I'm interested in. And uh, they said, oh, that sounds like it would be useful to Arab. So just take five days. And I thought, oh, no, this is a trap. So I insisted on having my pay cut. Um, and little by little, other people in the firm, because obviously everyone realised that I wasn't working on Fridays, other people at my level, which was quite junior at the time, um, found their way to me. I said, oh, how did you make the case for a four-day week? I said, oh, is this simple? I said, can I have a four-day week? I want to make jam. And um, one of the girls who said that, um, she's still working at Arab. She's now very senior. Um, she's done a four day week since she was grade three. She's now grade seven or eight. And um, she's in a rock band the other day. And so I think as an employee, you, you can ask. You can possibly be told no, but then again, like we're saying, if this is the future of work, then those companies that start to say no, are, you know, you might need to be more clever and like show them a page of the book or show them some of the evidence. 
Um, but it, I think you can always ask, and it's amazing how open people are. And I think particularly now, people are really open. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I think that's pretty good advice, actually. I didn't, I didn't realize ask for jam and get your day off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe don't mention the jam. The jam isn't your thing. Jam's not your jam. Like, cool. so. brilliant. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has any questions, um, but if not, um, or if you do, do just get in touch with us and we can share them with Sarah. Um, and, and thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's been really, really inspiring to sort of, I guess, have a think about the way people work in sort of thoughts as a process. Uh, I think Peter might actually have a question. Hi, Peter. Yeah. I was applauding. Ah, oh, <laughs> Zoom sometimes confuses me. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, yeah, Sarah shared her email. So if anyone has any questions or if they want to get in touch with her, uh, do just uh, send her an email. So it's sarah at workwild.space. Um, and, and thank you, Sarah, once again. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, we, we really enjoy doing these events and the, the response has been brilliant. Um, my colleague Magda shared a, a link to a feedback form. So if you have any thoughts, questions or suggestions, um, do let us know. I think our next In Conversation talk is in about two weeks um, and sort of further details for those will be shared. And as I mentioned earlier, we are also hosting a, a series of talks called the In Touch one, which looks more at sort of UWC and, and Atlantic College in particular. Um, but, but thanks for joining us um, and we hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Keith and Magda for the invitation to speak. Um, and I just like as a final point, I'm very ashamed that we've written and distributed the book through Amazon because obviously like it's like the antichrist of working wild as a company. Um, and some of, you know, we, but we did that because we wanted the message to get out there and it's the biggest book market. Um, but if you want to, if you're on an Amazon ban, which I imagine many people are, you can order them directly from me. And I've got some never touched Amazon being printed by a local printer version. So you just um, pop the email address in there. So, yeah. Brilliant. Well, All right. well, thank Thanks, you. everybody. Look forward to hearing you and your stories more. So what do we do? Do we just keep waving? <laughs> Uh, pretty much <laughs> thanks thanks sir it's been brilliant thank you yeah, thanks for taking the time yeah and tanya thank you for all your smiles you really kept me going <laughs> you made me feel like i was talking some sense <laughs> much appreciated bye, bye everyone thank you bye